Hi guys, Will Terry here, and this video is going to be called Don't Quit Your Art. Well, that's easy for you to say. Um, and before I get going on it, I just am kind of bursting a little bit because I just got uh, recently green lighted to do the sequel to Bonaparte. I don't know what the title is going to be yet, but we're we kind of got the I don't have a contract signed yet, but it's coming. So really excited. It did really well through the Halloween season. Um, the book is called Bonaparte Falls Apart. If you're new to my channel, um, I made a video on it uh, or mentioned it in a couple videos in the past. And um, so that's pretty cool. I'm really excited about that. It's it's neat to get a sequel because, um, I mean, obviously, if you have a a, a series of books, um, then they kind of the marketing kind of um, works together. So like, um, the more you have in that series, if somebody finds one of them and then they find out there's more in that series, they might want to buy more for their kids, and so it can be a good thing. Um, the fact that they're willing to do the second one says that the first one sold well enough, and hopefully I'll get royalties on that. Okay, so uh, I was on Twitter earlier today, and I just happened to see a couple of tweets from a friend of mine, and I didn't contact this friend, so I don't have permission, um, so I'm not going to mention this person's name, but I'm going to read the tweet uh, a little bit, because it got me thinking while I was on my bike ride today I've started riding my mountain bike again and um, I was just I was just thinking about it thinking this would be a good video topic and as you guys know I have mentioned this many times before uh, it's been a while since I made a video and I don't like following channels where they make a video uh, just because they're making a daily or they're making a weekly if I don't feel really strongly about making a video then I don't make it and so that's my contract with you so that hopefully if you're subscribed and you see one of my videos pop up in your feed you'll be more likely to, to watch it because you'll know that I hopefully took more time and thought behind it um, so that's kind of my my thing with YouTube is I'm I, I was doing for you know a few years I was doing like a weekly sometimes even a couple times a week because you know I had this this Google guy that was telling me this this representative from Google that was working with me that was like you know if you post more than twice a week we'll push you up and and do all this stuff and it's like but at the end of the day like I can't stand to follow channels where they get pumped full of just dumb stuff where they're saying basically the same thing now as I make this video I am going to repeat some things that I've said in the past so that is what it is but I think I don't know it's like I kind of feel like my philosophies on art are all intertwined and intermingled and so if I start going down one branch all of a sudden there's another branch that's kind of touching that does the sort of the same thing or kind of goes in the same direction and it and like all things kind of link together so it is what it is so uh, I'll read the tweets the first there was a couple one said it's hard when all the successful writers slash illustrators you hear speak you, you hear talk or you hear speak just say quote well you well you just can't quit and it'll all work out and then and unquote and then sure that worked for you dot 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 sorry being a pessimist and then the second one is honestly sometimes I think the solution is a break we can't be in a perpetual bountiful fall harvest we need a winter hibernation once in a while okay so th those are the tweets that kind of got me thinking today and uh, so I want to, as I kind of look into this and and uh, and thought about it, I, I thought, um, yeah, I think taking a break is a great idea um, from art. And I can think of times in my creative life where I have taken a few breaks, um, you know, and, and sometimes sometimes the creative breaks there can be creative breaks within the work that you're doing so let's say you're on a project uh, where you're working for a client and you're not feeling particularly inspired by the work that you're getting from that client well that whole time you're working on that project you're actually taking a creative break right even though 
a, a degree of creativity is required. I don't think that's what this person was talking about, but I mean, I think we all take creative breaks and we're not, there's no way to be a creative genius all the time. And in fact, creative genius doesn't really just spring forth out of nothing anyway. It comes from a lot of different things. It comes from the things that we're exposing ourselves to. It comes from um, uh, little things like taking, going a different way home or going, um, experiencing things that we've never experienced before. Uh, if you haven't seen the Jim Carrey movie, Yes Man, I mean, there's a, it's a funny comedy show and there's a lot of stupidity in it, but there's also a lot of truth to saying yes to things that you would normally say no to because so many of us get in a rut in our lives where, see, I'm already going off on a tangent, you know, where, where we do the same things, we eat the same things, we go to the same places, we get up the same time, we our routines kind of keep us non-creative and in order to make interesting connections because that's really what creativity is we have to experience life in different ways and so um so yeah so taking a break to do it depends on maybe what you're going to fill your time with but yeah i think taking a break can, can be a good idea but back to um the first tweet which was you know it's easy for someone who is successful to say don't quit it'll all just work out. Um, and that is easy for someone who's successful to say that. Absolutely. And I remember thinking that when I was coming up um, as an artist and I would get advice from people that were successful. In fact, I could tell you one story um, where, um, and I won't tell you who because it doesn't really paint this person in the greatest light, but this person had won the Caldecott, which is, if you're not familiar with that award, it is the the highest award one can receive for um, children's books, and um, it means overnight financial success. It means your book will stay in print forever, or as long as you're alive, which means you'll get royalties for life. Which means you will have basically. I mean, and just this is just the money side is guaranteed money. But again, money since money is life, then the money that you get that you don't ever have to work for again the the first year when you win the Caldecott supposedly is hell because you you lose your all your autonomy you are you are at the beck and call of the publisher and um anything they ask you to do you pretty much have to do which means a lot of flying around the country and speaking everywhere and giving presentations and school visits and photo ops and I mean, you're like Miss America for a year. Um, but after that, you know, the, you, you will get mailbox money that will come in for the rest of your life and a substantial amount. And it will guarantee you contracts for future books as long as you don't screw it up. But if you did well enough to get the Caldecott, almost, it's, you, you're good enough to continue making great work. And so, you know, someone that comes to mind recently is you know Dan Santat won the Caldecott for Beckel or Beckel I never know how to pronounce that one and then he just did the Humpty Dumpty book which is amazing and probably will get him more at least state awards but will probably get him at least an honorable a lot of people are putting him on the Caldecott uh, watch list again um, it's an amazingly creative book I can't remember the name of it but it's if you just type in Dan Santat and um, I think it's called First the Fall. I think it's it has the word fall in the title. I should know this. I should have been prepared. wasn't prepared to talk about that. But anyway, um, yeah, so you follow it up. And But the but back to the original story, the, the, the person that I want to talk about is not Dan. Um, it was someone else. And they uh, came out here to Utah to do a presentation. And uh, they were, we were all... Uh, speaking on a panel, there were I think there were three illustrators, not including this this Caldecott winner, and we were speaking on a panel for a, a writing uh, illustrating conference, and th the question was asked, um, and you're gonna I hope this doesn't sound petty that I'm like bringing this up, uh, because but I think it I think it illustrates a good point, and that is. We were all asked, how long does it take to make a book? Well, 
I answer, uh, we all answered, we all gave slightly different answers. And it was, you know, three months, four months, five months, six months, something like that. Um, and I, I even said, if I had to, if, if, you know, the deadline was pressing and the opportunity presented itself and it was just amazing, uh, ama amazing opportunity with a tight deadline, or I had other tight deadlines or other deadlines ahead of it. So sometimes what happens is you'll, you know, you'll, you've got work scheduled out and then a publisher asks you to, to uh, do a children's book and they say, well, we'll give you a nine month deadline. Well, you're already finishing up work from other projects. And so you often, you can't start right away. Um, and so sometimes I've been in a bind where I actually illustrated um, the three little gators. I painted those paintings. And this was before I was working digitally in 28 days. By the time that I had burned through my time, not from procrastinating, but just from all the other work that I had to get done, I had 28 days to paint that book. And I didn't do anything else. I didn't exercise. I, I would go for a uh, like a 15 or 20 minute walk a day. And I was literally in my chair painting for about 16 hours a day. My wife brought me food and it was the worst experience. It was, I mean, I, I loved working on that book, but I hated working on that book for obvious reasons. And um, it's no way to work. Well, so I explained this in the panel. And then when it was the turn for this Caldecott winner to, uh, to give their answer, it just came across as very high and mighty for lack of a better description with, well, I could never possibly do a book in less than a year. And I remember that the, that answer really, it, it hit me in the, in a spot that really kind of hurt because it's like, but I'm living on like at the time I was living like on job to job, uh, trying to make ends meet, trying to, trying to get enough money to, to feed my family and survive. And I am, I am projecting and making assumptions, but I do know what um, the Caldecott can bring to someone financially uh, because there, there's an estimated, just to do, doing some rough figures, and I think I've mentioned this before, but there are roughly 200,000 libraries in the world, and of most of those libraries will buy at least one copy, but most will buy, a lot will buy five copies of that Caldecott book in the first year. And then they'll buy that book every year. Um, libraries, one, one thing that a lot of people don't know is libraries go through books because obviously, you know, the users are um, using books, taking them home, dropping them. They, they Eventually they start to fall apart. And every year the libraries have a budget and they replace books that are falling apart. Uh, they also spend money make, uh, getting library bindings applied to some of the more popular books where, which are really expensive so they don't have to buy as many. But they end up buying a lot. And if you do the math, if an illustrator is getting, if, if the illustrator wrote and illustrated the book, which in this case they did, and let's just say low end, the, the uh, author illustrator gets a dollar a book. Well, if 200,000 libraries buy five copies, this doesn't include any consumer copies. This doesn't include the mom and dad or teachers buying any copies for their classrooms, just libraries alone. That's a million copies. So that's a million dollars. Um, if every one of those libraries bought five books. Now, I don't know what the actual breakdown is, but you can see really quick, um, and some author illustrators get a little bit more than that, depending on their contract. So, it, it, I understand where this tweet comes from, because when someone um, who has quote-unquote made it um, tells someone who hasn't made it, don't worry, it'll all work out, it does seem... Uh, you know, it, it seems, it does seem easy for them to say. It seemed easy for that illustrator, author illustrator to say, well, I ha I couldn't possibly do a book in, in less than a year. Well, duh, you've, you've made all this money. So you've got your living expenses taken care of, assuming that you've been responsible with your money. Um, and so you have time to tinker and to work and to enjoy your life and work on your book a little bit and you know and and now I'm not saying that all Caldecott winners do that some are very proficient even after they've won the award and they're they're putting out books and and working and writing and 
And in a perfect world, I would love to have a year to work on a book. So I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that I have to, I'm trying to anticipate all the comments that are going to misinterpret my words and find a hole in what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't take a year. I'm not saying that a month is good. I'm not saying 28 days is good. What I'm saying is that the more money and the more resources you have, the easier it is for you to be successful. You can, you can capitalize on your success with, with more successes. And those are privileges that we have, right? And I'm certainly not saying that I don't have privileges either because I do. Um, and I'm very grateful for what I have. But at that time, that hit me the wrong way. So I, I, I'm trying to address this um, tweet from the same mindset. And what I want to do is, is more dive into the, um, the motivations for, do, for making artwork. Because I think, that's, I think that's more important for us to get our minds around why we do the things we do um and 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 when we when we understand ourselves better we can better manage the frustrations of day-to-day -day grinds and work and 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 maybe having some depression come in or not feeling great one day and feeling bad for not working and that kind of feeds on itself um and and so one of the questions that i ask when i when i when i was writing today was um, you know, why do I make art? Why do you make art? Why are you drawing right now? Um, what is your reward? Things like that. Um, and so, you know, uh, the, the reasons are many. I think the main ones that I can think of are fame, fortune, the, the fact, the act of um, validation or being published, and then the credential you get from being published. So for instance, like let's say I wanted to, let's say my real passion was I wanted to start a, um, a YouTube channel and I wanted to talk to people and I want to give advice. There are people who are great at doing that. There are, um, you know, life coaches out there who love coaching other people. There are people, I mean, I love doing that. I love doing this. And you're going to be more credible if you're published so i can totally see that as a motivation like i want to help other people but they're not going to take me seriously unless i can do the thing or have done the thing that i want to help them do so that could be a motivation for being published right um and i think that's what th that wasn't mentioned in this tweet by the way but i know the person and i know what they're working on and i i'm assuming and i could be totally wrong <laughs> And so if you're, if this is your tweet and you are listening to this and you're like, no, well, you have it totally wrong. I'm going to go down this road assuming, because I think it's still valuable information, but I do apologize in advance if I've interpreted it wrong. But I think that's where this person is going in the frustration of like not getting traction in getting the attention of an editor or an art director, someone that can validate the work that's being done through a contract of publishing um fortune you know getting money for your work absolutely that is a valid um motivation um and i guess being famous is is something that is valid personally i think that um all of these though <laughs> are corruptible are, are corrupting in a roundabout way not in in and of themselves necessarily because is is trying to make money bad no is wanting people to recognize the work that you've done bad no is wanting people to respect you for what you've done bad no um but i think that those things as a motivation for making art are the wrong ways to look at it and, and the reason for that is um, I think that art can only be created, true actual art, art that's inspired, art that will change other people's lives. I don't think that that can be created unless the real motivation is making art for art's sake, making art to please yourself. Um, getting an idea and running with it 
whether you're getting paid or not. I think that that is now that's another thing that I think a lot of people and maybe some of you listening to this will say talking back to the camera go well that's easy for you to say you've made money you've been published you're living off of being an artist and so but the person like me who's trying who's struggling or who has lost their job and you know in I, I get letters all the time for people who have who have been you know forced out of the animation world or um or just lost their art related job or their graphic design job and they're trying to find the next gig to make money and they're looking at it so that is easy for me to say but at the same time i think if you look at the best art that has been created in the world and the best inventions and i put art and inventions pretty much in the same category most of the best innovations and best artwork have been created from the sheer passion of wanting to create that thing so if we look at and i had a list up and then i restarted my computer um so just bear with me okay well anyway so look at like inventors like leonardo da vinci i mean he was more than just a painter more than just an artist he was also an inventor um sir isaac newton um Graham Bell, Benjamin Franklin, um, James Watt. I'm just going through the list here. <laughs> Samuel Morse. Um, the one that, uh, you know, you have Thomas Edison, but you also have Tesla, right, who supposedly did did all the the heavy lifting, and then, and then Bell or Edison stole. Uh, I don't know the whole story behind that, but... But these guys, most of most of these 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 guys, and um, they they created because that's what they wanted to do. That was their life's work. You know, they were interested in in the thing that they were working on, and it. And I I I don't believe that for most of these people, money was the motivator. I mean, in the back of your mind, you know, if you. I mean, if you let, let's let's go more modern and and take um, you know Steve Jobs and Wozniak, so those guys, their passion was playing around and tinkering with computers, and they were doing that on their own. They weren't. They didn't. They didn't have any clue what they were going to be creating. They had no idea what they were, uh, what was in their future. They couldn't see. Apple. It's easy to it's easy to look at those guys and or, or successful people like that and say, oh, that was your angle. That's what you were looking to do is to create this multi multi billion dollar company. At one time, Apple had more money than in the in its coffers than than um, the U.S. government supposedly when we were going through the the um, the financial crisis or budget thing. I don't know. So I think the best way to look at it is, you know, are you making art for you or are you making art thinking of the thing that you will get if you get validated by someone else who really probably doesn't fully get you or get your art anyway? I mean, can anyone really understand what you're what you're trying to say with your art um, as well as you do? or? the vision that you have um, and so when you try to seek val validation through an editor you you also don't realize that how many times you're like if you're sending in a manuscript and or, and or illustrations you don't know how many times your illustrations have been brought up in a meeting and then shot down by the one person in the room and then you never hear about it because that happens and you know your your images might be printed off taken into a meeting and they present five different illustrators and then they choose one and then the other four never find out that they were even up for that job so things are happening behind the scenes all the time like that um, and meanwhile you're at home and you're saying well I'm just not getting any traction I don't know how long I can keep this up and yet you've been close a bunch of times so this that actually happened to Brett Helquist where he and he's the guy that uh, my friend that did the uh, the book covers for the series of unfortunate events and he was ready to quit so many times and 
you know, he would call me and I would kind of talk him back in and, and I would say, but I just don't think people have seen your work enough because it's amazing. And I can't imagine that you're not getting work. And he wasn't getting work. And then finally one day he just got that job and it just, everybody in the publishing world knows who Brett Helquist is now. He's super famous. And it's all just because the right art director or, and or editor found his work at the right time for the right project and he he nailed it. I mean, he he did him. He did what he, he he's a really hard worker, and a great designer and a great illustrator. And he he put it all together, and um, and he has had work ever since. And he's made a lot of money off of those because he did end up getting a a little royalty deal. Um. So yeah. Um. Now reasons to keep going, right? Like why why keep going? And I. I have three here that I, I think are, you know, I was thinking about this today and I just thought, man, these are things that I, that are, that really apply to me. So maybe they'll apply to you. I don't know. Um, the first one is the, the future projects. Now this is, this is for someone who's thinking about quitting, right? But if, you, if you're thinking about quitting, then maybe if you're willing to come, totally stop making art then maybe you're not an artist in the first place I mean like if you're doing it for these other reasons then and you're never doing it for yourself but I've always been in that mindset of making art for myself um, and and making art just to feel that feeling of, of relief of man I created this thing and I can't wait to show it to people and you know early on you show it to people and, they, and they're like oh and it really hurts, right? Uh, right? It hurt. We've all we've all felt that. But when when you really impress someone else, and you and you find people that really identify with what you're doing, man, there's there's almost no other feeling in the world like that. And so that, to me, is like the the biggest motivator is it's like the feeling of like purging myself of a piece of art that had to get out that the world has never seen. And that I've never seen, and I want to see what it's going to look like. Um, and so, getting that to come out, and then understanding and realizing that the all those other motivations will be satisfied just through that process of getting—I mean, for the lack of a better descriptor, like vomiting this artwork out constantly. And then eventually, as it gets better and better, because over time, the more you do something, if you have good practice, um, if you have good instruction. There's my little pitch for sbslearn.com. Um, but if you can if you can practice well, and you can increase over time, uh, those other motivations, those other things, you can put those on a goal list, and you'll see that as the years pass, you'll go, wow, those goals were all satisfied. Those those other rewards, but the reward I think has to come within first, you know why you picked up the pencil um, in the first place um, and understanding that another one is um, I'm, I'm realizing that basically I just covered two of them because they're basically the same thing I mean I can't hit that one hard enough is that it it has to fill your fulfill your soul um, you have to kind of make art to make yourself happy and remember, there's other people out there that are just like you that are going to find value. Not everybody's going to like what you do, and that's fine. Um, in fact, most people won't like what you do, um, and that's fine. And that that means that's actually good because if you're if you're creating for the masses, then your stuff is going to be very predictable. Um, it's going to be very bland. Um, you know, like like most people can stomach. Well, that that's a bad analogy because a lot of a lot of people are going to hate that one. Um, most people wear tennis shoes or comfortable type shoes to jog in that's probably the most common shoe that's sold right they're comfortable not particularly stylish but they get the job done okay well no one you're never gonna win any awards or turn any heads with with basically like running shoes right nobody's gonna give you any compliments on your running shoes but everybody likes them so you don't want to make art like that. You want to make art that a niche of people really respond to. Um, that's really different. That really, really um, turns certain people's heads and go, wow, that's amazing. 
Um, the, the, but the other re reason is for the unknown um, future projects that you will create. The things, you know, if, if so, let me tell you a story and then I'm going to show you something. Um, and I have, I have shared this before on this channel, but it was quite a while ago. And I know that I have like new people coming in for different times. So I, I sometimes when I'm at events, I'll ask people like, did you hear me talk about this? I'm like, no, oh, no. They'll, they'll say, well, I follow your YouTube channel. Oh, well then you heard me talk about this. No. Oh, then you heard me talk about that. No. So I know that you guys aren't watching all my videos. So I'm giving you this, this story again. But when I was living in California, uh, and we were going through our, the, the start of our financial meltdown because my wife was starting to really have medical problems. And I was really in a panic on like, how do I replace our health care? Because our health care was really expensive. Um, and with my wife and my son having um, their autoimmune, autoimmune diseases, we had to go to these expensive doctors to figure everything out. I was like, I was seeing the medical bills and most of it was being covered by our insurance. And I was like, we're going to lose this insurance if my wife can't teach um, junior high anymore. So I was in panic mode and I was looking across the street and there were three guys and we lived in a small town and most of the in, in near Fresno and most of the uh, people around us were worked for the prison. Like there were on my street, there were like six different prison guards and they had really nice cars. They had really nice houses. We were renting a house at the time. They had um, they had swimming pools in their backyards, and they it seemed to me looking from the outside it just looked like their life was so easy. They didn't go to college; they just went in and became a prison guard. And in California, they pay amazingly well, and the benefits are amazing. I think that's one of the reasons why California is hurting financially right now, um, because they these guys were making like up to. One hundred twenty, one hundred thirty thousand dollars a year plus their. When they retired after only twenty years, they would retire at eighty percent of their highest year of salary. So most of them would would work really hard for one year and try to. I think the top guy in the state had made like one hundred and forty five thousand dollars as a prison guard because he just took every shift from from other guys that he could get. Uh, but the guys around me were making well over one hundred thousand dollars a year, and so they were going to retire in their late 40s because most of them started in their early 20s so in their mid to late 40s they would retire and make at least eighty thousand dollars a year and um and i was just looking at the these guys going i can't believe that i'm sitting here struggling you know to to get freelance work and my wife's gonna lose her job and oh Maybe I should be a prison guard. And so I really looked into becoming a prison guard because I was I was really looking for the money. And, you know, I just felt like that was the most important thing. And sometimes it is. Sometimes you have to you have to do what you have to do to, to make ends meet. Um, and I actually went through the class. I, I drove an hour away and took a class. I actually was like almost two hours away and stayed there for a week and took this long class that was a class every day that we had to do um i did the physicals i did the um filled out all the paperwork and got a, got my background checks and just started going through this checklist of things to be hired and then i got my letter saying okay we're going to hire you because they had a shortage and you could just go in and, and basically do it if you if you know if you had a pulse and you didn't have a criminal record um, and you were in relatively good physical shape, you could, you could get that job. So I was like, I mean, I'm not qualified to do anything but illustration work, but I am qualified to do this, and it will definitely take care of my family and take care of our medical needs. And so that was kind of the game plan. I was going to do it, and I was dreading it. And every day I would talk to these guys, and they, would, they were trying to talk me out of it. And, and I was like, why why are they trying to talk me out of this thing you know like they would they would say yeah but you you make art you know you're at home you um isn't there a way you can figure out how to make a little bit more money or i mean like like it'll kill your your soul going in this place you're like a prisoner they would tell me all the downside 
all the horrible things, all the pedophiles that would um, try to tell you their their little pedophile stories and just all the sickness that goes on in there and and the stabbings and just all the worst stuff and the, how dangerous it was. And one guy down the street, they pointed him out and they said, you should go talk to this guy down here um, because he has two years left and he quit. So he's, he's giving up the $80,000 a year pension because he had gotten stabbed. Um, it's a long story, but anyway, he got stabbed and the guy who stabbed him was still there in the jail and said, if you come back, we'll finish the job. We'll make sure somebody finishes it. They, they really didn't like this guy. And the sad thing, well, I'll just tell it really quick because it, it makes you wonder like what kind of person this was. He was the nicest guy. And what he did when, when I went in, when I was thinking about going in, the, these guys around the street said, you're going to have to decide if you're going to be a guard's guard or a prisoner's guard. If you're a prisoner's guard, you help the prisoners smuggle drugs or do whatever they want. And you're basically like their servant and but they won't hurt you but then the guards all hate you and then they will not come to your rescue they won't help you if you need help and it's just like the this huge thing and if you're a guards guard then you have to turn your back when other guards do bad things and i'm like what what kind of a nightmare am i thinking about going into here you know and then and so i was getting scared i was getting these stories all the time so this guy down the street that got stabbed he decided to try to play the middle of the road and they were like you, whatever you do, don't do what he did. Like he 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 was like, no, I'm just going to follow the rules. I'm not going to be a guards guard. And I'm not going to be a prisoners guard. And so what happened was, the this one prisoner wanted him to do something illegal. He said, you know me, I'm I'm not with them, and I'm not with you guys. I'm just here to do my time. I'm just here, and the the one guy just decided to get mad at him and stabbed him for it. And the other guards wouldn't come and help him, and he almost died. So anyway long story but I started thinking about it and I started thinking man you know I I, I don't know if I want to give up art I, I knew that if I had made that decision to become a, a prison guard that I would probably be totally giving up my career um, as an illustrator and the crazy thing was I had contracts going on I was making good money I wasn't dying in any sense. It's just that I was losing my wife's income um, and that we had become dependent on. And that was the scary part of it. So I really thought about it. I prayed about it. And I just came to the conclusion that I shouldn't do it and that we should move back here to Utah. And so we did. Um, and luckily, everything worked out so much better than... If I would have done that, I hated the area that we lived in. No offense to anybody that lives near Fresno, but I personally, not being from there, I just, I didn't have any ties to that area. Um, and the landscape that around the area that we were living, we weren't near the Sierras. It was, it was compared to out here, uh, rec outdoor recreation was just like non-existent. All the land around our town was private, so I couldn't ride my bike anywhere. I kept getting kicked out of people's lands when I would try to ride illegally and um just it was it was just not a fun future for me that i didn't want to do and it was all because i wanted to make more money i was making it for the reason i was going to make that decision for the reason of making money so i chose to to you know just have faith and and move to what i felt was the right thing to do which was to not go in there and take that job um and so the, 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 what I'm trying to get to here is that there are, as an artist, as you, you know, you have a certain potential that you can reach and it's pretty much limitless. I know that that sounds crazy, but I really believe um, that if we tapped into our true potential, we would astonish ourselves. The problem, the reason we don't is because we are afraid of the failing. We're, tr we're afraid of trying and failing and what people will think we're more afraid afraid of what peer of peer pressure and in fact i've heard that people are in general i don't know if this is true or not but i've heard people are more afraid of public speaking than of death and i can believe that because it is if you don't speak publicly a lot it can be very scary i spoke to a group of 300 people yesterday um, at byu and it's gotten really easy for me but when i was a kid uh when i was young uh, speaking in front of a group of people was like 
I mean, my knees would start knocking and I would, I would start stuttering and I couldn't even, you know, and, and if I had to give a speech, like even for like a, cause I was a boy scout, even, even for a court of honor in front of like 20 or 30 people, I would, I, I would, I would dread it for weeks before it happened, you know? Um, but your potential is so much higher than where, where you are right now. And so the projects that you are going to create with your newfound talent, the talent that you're going to develop, will amaze you. If you could see those projects now, they would amaze you. If I, if I was in school and I could see my, my little book while I was in school, I would be amazed. I would be like, who created this? This is amazing. You know? And I'm not saying it's, it's amazing from an artistic standpoint, but it would be amazing to me back then to see this and to go, wow, someone created this. You know, someone created these, all these illustrations and put it in a book and, you know, and, it, and, it, and the, the level is so much higher than what I am capably, are currently capable of doing. So if you're contemplating quitting or stopping for a long time, and I know this tweet was just talking about taking a break, so I'm, I'm taking this much further than the tweet, but it got me thinking down this road. Um, but any, this is for anyone out there who's, who's thinking about quitting you're you really are taking creativity out of the world if if that is your gift is being an artist then then you're you're taking future art from the future world and that's that's a shame you know because then we'll never get to see what it is that you are going to create and and as someone who consumes art on a daily basis who can't get enough of it that's you know that's that would be a really sad thing and i wonder how many people have already done that who whose potential you know and i and i i know i've talked about this before but but like all the kids who were super creative in school who were told that they weren't worth anything by the school system and when i mean told they they wouldn't be physically verbally told uh, that you're not worth anything but the system rewards people who do well in math english and science and it does not reward people who do good, good in the arts. And so speaking from my personal experience, uh, you, you, we may, we may not be, we may not be good at English, math, and science, but we're smart enough to know what the system values and what it doesn't value. And that's a tragedy. And it's a travesty to all those souls out there who feel broken and who feel like they weren't appreciated and who feel like uh, their contributions weren't worth enough to uh, to get a good grade or to be, uh, to be valued, to be able to move on to a higher education based on their portfolio, not based on their GPA. Um, our system is kind of a mess that way. Um, but I hope that this helps. You know, I'm, I'm kind of getting off track with, with that part, but... I mean, I just, I just really feel like, to, to sum this up, you're, the reason you create art should be for yourself. It shouldn't be for those external rewards. Those are great. They're, they're great byproducts of a great art career. But if they're the things that you put at the top, then you probably will never reach them. That'll probably be the, the, the reason. Like any company that sets out to make money will almost assuredly fail. I know that that sounds backwards and it probably sounds wrong to people who hate capitalism but but from someone who considers himself an entrepreneur and who looks at businesses that are really successful their first and inform, first and foremost goal has to be in creating something that other people can't live without now companies go wrong all the time and companies make bad mistakes and companies do evil things so I don't want to I'm not trying to say that that doesn't happen that there's not corruption that there's not crony capitalism and things like that but in the beginning if you think about the products that you buy um, and you think about the selection that you have and why you select one product over another um, the, the companies that get passionate about the art of the product that want to make your experience the best that it can possibly be. I mean, I'll think about Apple again, uh, the iPhone, right? Um, the iPhone is, and the iPad are my two favorite devices. Like, like if I could look at all the objects I have, the ones that I couldn't live without, those would be very high on the list. 
and and Apple didn't you know those guys didn't sit around going well man how can we make billions of dollars that was never the question you know how can we be famous that wasn't the question um, the question was how can we make something that we love that we just want to have and that other people will also want to have you know and so I think that's where you have to be with your art if you can get there you're on the right track if you can't you'll probably struggle for a long time anyway uh, thanks for watching I I used to I used to sign off with um, don't subscribe unless you want to see more stuff like this I might go back to that because uh, I want you to subscribe but not if you don't want to see stuff like this okay